as we know, in Turkey and Fethiye Çetin, who was here a month ago or so, uh, said in Turkey, assassinations and murders have been commonplace, as we know. And usually within a year, maybe two, the dossier is closed, it's forgotten, and people move on. And in Haran's case, it's been eight years. There's still action in the legal front. Yes, we have the trigger man in prison and a couple of others, but just recently they arrested the police officers and chiefs of police. Uh, so do you think it's unusual that uh, a political assassination is still being prosecuted in the courts, given Turkish history? Is it a special case for Hrant? Is it a special case because it was an Armenian? Or something different, dynamic, within the Turkish political spectrum? There is an interesting development in Turkey. Indeed, they are now moving ahead. And first time they arrested three police officers, whom we knew from the first day that they were complicit of the crime. And the same government supported these police officers, never filed an investigation against these individuals. They are in prison now. And if they had arrested them eight years ago, on the first day, we would have said, okay, it's a good development. To be honest, if you ask me, I might be wrong. If they arrest these three police officers, I would say there is no justice in this country unless the big boys, the, 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 those who really planned and put in the action, if they cannot be in prison, there won't be any justice for Grant's case. And I would add one more thing. If there is no recognition of Armenian genocide, there is no justice for Grant deep assessment. I would put both in connection, very clearly, because three police officers today cannot be a satisfactory factor for us anymore. Because of very simple reason, Do Perinçek established Talat Pasha Commission. Talat Pasha Commission, or the group of Talat Pasha, organized demonstration in Europe in favor of Talat Pasha to support the Talat Pasha. And we know also, Hrant Dink was assassinated as a revenge of Talat Pasha. He was assassinated exactly the same way. As you know, Tahlerian approached Talat from the back. And as you also know, actually it was planned that Tahlerian should not escape from the sea. He should have really give in himself to the police and defend his case. And this was the plan. We, how do we know that? The police officer that arrested yesterday, last week, had a phone conversation with the murderer after the event, saying that, hey, it was not our plan. Why he did he escape? And he has a, yeah, he was a little bit maybe excited and so on. So the plan was exactly the same. They took Talat Pasha's revenge from Iran. So Hrant became for us a symbol of Armenian genocide also. I think we should now combine justice for Hrant, justice for Armenian genocide. This is this should our demand, this is how we feel. It. Uh, talking about Talat Pasha reminded me it's relevant to what's going on today of because he's the poster boy not only is the, the butcher of our people but he's the poster boy for Turkish state duplicitousness and it reminded me of the last time he played a card game with Kirkor Zora where he was until that point still pretending to be his friend while he had already signed this arrest warrant, which was already a death warrant. And then the subsequent days after Kirkor's arrest, when he denied to Kirkor's wife that there was anything serious. Why do I say this? And 
Today, we as Armenians, with this history behind us, this distrust, justified distrust, watch what the Turkish government is doing. You mentioned some good things and some bad things. In your opinion, how are, what is the litmus test? How are we supposed to take an action that might be viewed as a positive step, as a genuine positive step, as opposed to some gamesmanship, trying to con the world opinion, etc., but not meaning it. You know what I'm talking about, so I'll let you answer. I think it's a very important point uh, to understand the coming development in Turkey too. There will be some changes also. There will be some changes and this is the main problem among Armenians or among other who oppose the government. It is like a half full glass of uh, water. And, or the glass half full with water. And those among us who are optimists they say, they will say, yeah, look here, the half of the glass is full. And the other pessimists, they will say, yeah, but the other half is empty. And we will really kill each other. Empty, empty, full, empty, full. We should get away from this debate. How we can get away from that discussion? We can get away from this discussion with a very, sim very simple sentence. Mm -hmm. What do we want? Forget this glass, whether it's full or empty. What is our ultimate goal? What do we understand from justice? What want we Turkey should do? I tell you, if you are very optimist, I tell you an optimist alternative for you. Turkey is on the way becoming a United States. How United States deals with Native Americans Turkey is going to deal with Armenians. Are we happy with it? This will be the development, or this is already development, slowly. Now, what is American way of dealing with Native Americans? This is not a state issue. Leave it to civil society. They should deal with, issue, with that issue. This means, in all American universities, there are chairs on Native Americans. But they are not genocide studies chair. They are mostly anthropology, cultural history, and you can teach on Native American history, there is freedom of speech. This is the development in Turkey. Slowly and slowly, if you have money enough, if you will go to Istanbul, you can establish any chair at any Istanbul university on the anthropology department, or on the cultural history department, or in the language department on Armenian language. They already established one uh, similar uh, institute in uh, Mardin University. So, you can possibly develop a museum in, in Turkey, on, like the Native American Museum in Washington. Have you been there? If you enter in that museum, it's a wonderful museum. You can find everything on Native American, except mass atrocities and the genocide. It's not there. There could be some museum in Turkey also. They already decided to put a museum in Dersim for the Dersim district. So this is the process in Turkey, developing. Are we going to be happy with that solution? Is it what we want? One more example. In the United States, do you know how many court cases are there? In case of land, water usage, and all or the sacred places recently now the Obama administration gave for example some sacred native places for the pipelines from Canada for the energy investment there are so many court cases some court cases ends with negative results in some cases the natives are successful recently a court case ended in Texas and the natives won 500 million dollars for their, for their natural resources because American government had been using this over the years. It was a successful case, but the court took approximately 25, 30 years. I forgot the exact years of the court cases. You know that? There are so many court cases in Turkey now. Recently, a Diyarbakir court case in Diyarbakir, you might have heard about it. 
the Arbakir airport actually belongs to an Armenian and he filed a lawsuit and 2012, first instance, now 2005, three years passed, he lost in Diyarbakir, second instance in court of concessions, and in uh, Yargatay, the appeal court, uh, now they turn the decision. It will go back to Diyarbakir again, and then will back again to uh, court of concessions, it will take another maybe 15. There might be one court decision with success, there might be one other court decision with, without success. Is, is this what we are going? Is it what we want? Is it the way of solving or facing with history and solving and historic injustices? If this is our ultimate goal, then this is the process going there. So, what should we do actually? We should develop another alternative. We should really loud and clear say, American way of facing history might work with natives. This is natives' problem, this is American government's problem, this is American society's problem. But we cannot be satisfied with such a solution in Turkey. Why? Natives don't have a nation state like Armenia. There is an Armenian. Natives don't have a diaspora outside of the United States. So we need something more. What we need, what is the ultimate demand of Armenians? I have one single answer to that question also, and I call it 1951 Luxembourg. What is 1951 Luxembourg? This is Germany, Israel, and Jewish diaspora. This is how they solve their Beginning with the end of Second World War, 1945, Jewish communities throughout the world asked recognition and compensation. They fought through this and at the end, 1951, in Luxembourg, German government negotiated with Israel government and as a separate entity negotiated with Jewish diaspora, not as one, separated, because they are two separate entities. At the end, two separate agreement was signed. Compensation for Israel and compensation for Jewish diaspora. And how Jewish diaspora organized this? Very simple. Before going to Luxembourg for negotiation, they came together, all those Jewish groups and organizations, which are fighting with each other like the Armenians, it's human nature, we have so many organizations, they came there, they still continue their fight with each other, but on one ground they really agreed with each other. It is the negotiation with Turkey, negotiation with Germany. And at the end, claim commission. Go to internet and read the history of claim commission. Today in my center, Holocaust and Genocide Study Center, we have three, four, young students support by this claim commission and the money is coming from German government. So, my point assess is, we should really be, make it very clear. We should say, number one, recognition of a crime as a crime. This is a crime against humanity, this is genocide, there must be an apology for this crime. And three, immediate negotiation between Armenian government and Turkey, immediate negotiation, diaspora and Turkish government for compensation of Armenian losses. There is no lower demand for us. So whether the glass is full or empty, this is their problem. This is not our problem. Our problem is we want genocide recognition or a recognition of a crime, crime against humanity, and we want an apology and we want concrete negotiation in form of both bilateral parties and at the end we want an agreement of compensation. This is what we want. The rest, whether they put an ad in the newspaper or not, then this could be the secondary issues. We should really, whenever Turkish government make any gesture, we should call them, come to the table, talk with us, Leave at all these small gestures, 
We want justice and this can be only done by compensation of that boss, nothing else. Thank you. Do you know how many 
cabinet members that were in Ottoman cabinet, the Armenians. Two, you know who was one of them and who became then the Armenian representative in Paris Peace Conference. One of the Ottoman minister, Armenian minister, uh, I forgot now the name so I don't want to make a mistake, he became one of the member of Armenian peace delegation in Paris and fought against Ottoman Turkish government. This is the history. So, Etienne will harm himself by accepting this job because he is responsible. We can blame him for anything what government is doing. This is his difficulty. Mm -hmm. You might have read my article on textbooks, Turkish textbooks. You know in Turkish textbooks, they call Armenians as a national threat to Turkey. You are here. You are a national threat to security of Turkey. And this is in Turkish textbooks written. And Etienne now took this responsibility for this issue. So I assume he will harm himself. And this is a harm. He will not harm ourselves. He cannot harm us. Because we are not going to debate whether Etienne is going to put one drop more in his half glass, uh, half full water glass. This is Etienne's problem. My problem or our problem is again, it is a full recognition of a crime, taking out these school books from curriculum and a compensation in form of money or other forms, there are several other forms, compensation of Armenian genocide. We should look from the perspective where we are and what we want, not what they can do or can do. Um, my last question and then we'll go to the audience. Uh, I, I believe I agree with your theory that uh, Iran's assassination was uh, a revenge for Talat Pasha. But, and perhaps not mutually exclusive, many also believe that the main reason that he was targeted was <coughs> being the first person that really dug up this silence taboo of Islamized Armenians. A, do you agree that was one of the reasons? And since Hiran's murder, has there been any change in the what in what it is the the, the silence, the taboo status, at least for those of us you know who observe this, you know, a lot of Turks have a bigger problem with saying there was a gen bigger problem. Not with saying genocide, but by admitting that you know, they had a grandmother or a grandfather that was Armenian. So, where do you stand? And I know you're working on this in your books as well. It is really a very interesting topic. You already mentioned either in your talk or here. Uh, there is something different in Hrant's case. As you know, there were other individuals in Turkey who were assassinated throughout the history and they were more famous than Hrant. Uğur Mumcu, Muammer Aksoy, Abdi Pekci. Who remembers them now? I mean, maybe somebody, but there is no commemoration. And the number for Uğur Mumcu was in second year, maybe very big, and today nobody is doing it. There is something different in Hrant case. Every year, more and more people going on the street and commemorating Hrant's assassination. This has a symbolic character because he touched the weakest point of Turkish society. And namely, what he touched was the founding legend, the founding myths of Turkey. We Turks, we understand that this Turkey was established by a fight against Great Britain, France, imperialist power, and so on and so forth. What Hrant made it clear to us that Armenians was an essential part.
part of Ottoman society. Armenians is today an important part of Turkish society and his coming out and say that I am a Turkish citizen and I want the same right as other Turkish citizens in the country made really it riddled the entire society. He made us clear that this society actually, Turkish society, is a kind of a genocidal society. You may remember his some sentences on the confiscated Armenian property laws issue. To Neshe Yuzel, I mean, you will read my book in April, it's coming in English. I put his interview in the beginning of the book where he says, don't touch the property issue. Then you can really destroy your republic. Because our republic established on genocide and Iran's voice was making this clear to us. This was really the reason of his assassination. And it changed a lot. You already spoke about it. He is indeed Martin Luther, King of Turkey. Take an example myself. We were dragged from court, court, from court to court. There were several court cases against us. There were campaigns against us in Turkish daily newspaper. They were harassing us and they were attacking us. Even in the United States, they were attacking my lectures. I was physically attacked in New York. In several other places, they tried to attack me. And we were really the bad guys, really the prisoner of the nation. After Hiran's assassination, the entire perception changed in Turkey. Today, my guess is the common sense in Turkey is that, you know what, something bad happened in 1915. It is not anymore we are not anymore the prisoners, we are not anymore threatener of the nation and so on. We, Hrant's assassination changed the psychological atmosphere of the society. I tell you, we won the psychological war in Turkey. Why? Very simple. A president needs to change the official commemoration day of Gallipoli moved to April 24. So they are competing with us now. <laughs> they know they lost the psychological war. They are in defensive position. Follow the newspaper, the discussion. We are not defending ourselves. We are a little bit aggressive now. What are we saying? The tone of our discussion also. Not enough, not enough, more, more. This is the tone. Was it the case before Hurrah's assassination? No. We, before Hurrah's assassination, it was, no, we don't mean that. We don't mean that. We, we, we meant actually what happened with something different. So this was, we were in defensive position. The discourse in society changed. Maybe there was not, there is not much change in the sense of concrete development, but the psychological atmosphere change in society. I think we are the overhand in the public debate. They have to, they defend themselves, and this is what Gurand really managed. He succeeded us. Thank you, thank you. In real, in real. Thank you. Take 15 minutes maximum for questions and answers. Um, I would like you to state your name and make your question as brief as possible so others get a chance. Please don't give speeches. If you're representing an organization, please state your name and the organization, otherwise just your name. And Ari, you're going to help us with the microphone. So, I'll open it. Mark Shanyan in the back. Thank you. My name is given, so I don't have to say it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, professor, 
You brought the Luxembourg case, which I'm very, very happy that you did. As a prerequisite of what you described, there's a similarity of what happened in Luxembourg and what's actually happening for Armenians. Okay, you said that there should be a recognition of a crime. The venue for a recognition of a crime is a court. And therefore, don't you think that you also have to mention that somehow we have to go to ICJ, get a court ruling, and therefore a crime is declared because the only venue that can declare a crime is a court, and therefore that leads to the Luxembourg model of sitting around the table and negotiating. It can be one way, but I don't believe uh, that a court uh, decision is necessary. Uh, court decisions are also political and they have their own political calculations. What I'm calling is acknowledgement by Turkish government 1915 as a crime. It's enough. They should be ready to accept this as a crime and they should sit on table and start talking. You may have heard, I mean, uh, there are a lot of, of course, gossips around. Armenian community is a very small community and there are a lot of public secrets. Uh, I know, personally, you might have heard also, Davutoglu, when he uh, talks one-to-one to one, some, some Armenian friends, he says that, yeah, it's a crime against humanity, we can acknowledge it, but, and so on and so forth. So, the other way, the uh, International Court of Justice is that, I don't think that it's a reasonable way because Armenian genocide case, this is my point, is not a legal dispute. It is a moral issue. Legally, it is a very complicated case in the sense of 100 years passed away and there is no genocide there that you should put on the tri uh, trial and there have been enough decisions there that you can take as court decision, as international bodies decision. I give you a couple of examples. Uh, 24, uh, 26 May 1915, the declaration of all uh, great allied powers, called 1915 as crime against humanity. It is an international law rule in itself. The Paris Peace Conference, the decision of the subcommission in Paris Peace Conference for calling 1915 as crime against humanity is also a legal body for itself and you, there is no need an additional court decision which why should, I mean in which sense court should discuss I can make it a comparison with Holocaust everybody knows there is no one single court case on Holocaust that call Holocaust as genocide the all Nuremberg court cases, Auschwitz court cases, other court cases, even Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, they were all opened from the crime against humanity, crime against peace, and war crime. So I personally won't go a legal course in that sense, because legally there is not much to debate there. The main issue is moral issue. This is the opinion of the legal scholars. William Shabash or the other uh, scholars who are leading scholars in our field, they also agree with me on that point. It is the morality and morally Turkish government should acknowledge this as a crime. Sabay thing. The other, of course, another option. Thank you. John Bosakian, uh, I will go back to uh, I'm expecting, or well, there is a big probability that Mahjubia will visit the Armenian Genocide Monument on April 24, 1915. How will it will be interpreted by the Armenian government and the Turkish government? His visit to the monument. I hear first time. I haven't heard it before. Uh, I have a very simple answer to all these kind of questions. Whoever wants to visit a memorial and show the respect to the dead victims, they should welcome. I have no problem with it. Me being a counselor to the Prime Minister of Turkey, being an official of the Turkish government, 
Then I will say an advisor cannot apologize in name of a government. He is not an elected representative, representation, representative of Turkey. He is an advisor. This is the other problem of Etienne. I mean, he might make some advice to Prime Minister, but it is the executive body which implement the uh, decisions or make the decisions. I am expecting an apology from official elected Turkish body. It could be a parliament, it could be state president or prime minister. They can debate and discuss among themselves, but it should be an elected representation. Gürbüz Çapan, elected mayor, visited the genocide memorial 1995. Since then there were other deputies, individuals, they were all going there. So I personally would welcome if he goes there, but I won't characterize this as an official visit of Turkish government. Or in case you see Or in case an independent thinker sometimes. <laughs> uh, the mayor of Diyarbakir went to Armenia too, just recently. I, some people know that I have interviewed uh, Haranti two hours on television and it was shown on Terete in Turkey. In it, I had argued with him that he wanted to change the one word in the national song of Turkey that we are not Turks, we are Turkish citizens. So that incited a lot of things and he went to court for that too. You think that also played a little bit maybe in this? Um, I don't think that it was a some new discovery of Hrant, uh, instead of, I mean, calling Turkish citizen, we use, in, or Turks, or Turkish citizen, the new movement in Turkey beginning 1980s, 90s, the term that we use, citizen of Turkey. So instead of Turkish, people started using term Turkey, and citizens of Turkey, and of course, Hrant incorporated, took this uh, slogan and uh, develop the ideas towards that direction. Uh, this might not play a crucial role in the decision. I think in Hrant's case, <coughs> the one single reason, you can bring it to one single element. He was an Armenian and he said that I'm an equal Armenian but I'm not a Turk. This was too much for Turkish society for the rulers. Thank you. Okay. First, and then I'll come to the gentleman. Yeah, Professor, uh, today we have, let's say, a good number of Turkish intellectuals. Your name? I'm oh, part of my question, sorry. Yeah. Uh, a good number of Turkish intellectuals who are recognizing the reality of the Armenian genocide. I mean, yourself, Fethiye uh, Çetin, Ahmed Ansal, Ahmed uh, Altan, uh, Aisha Hu, many, many of, of you. Thank you very much for that. But on the other hand, we have millions of Turks who have studied history at their schools where they are telling them that the Armenians, they were traitors, and the, the real people who were genocided were the Turks. So this is a, a, a big problem, I think, because all those people are now full of hatred against Armenians. Ahmed Altan is uh, suggesting that the Armenians should take now from where Hrant stopped where Hrant finished, and go and communicate with those people, with, with the new generation, and to try to change their minds, try to convince them. Once they are convinced, they will press on their governments to recognize the genocide. I mean, how far, let's say, this is illogical, or how, how true this can be? Thank you. I mean, it's a very important point. I remember myself discussing this issue with you a couple of years ago and this is a very serious problem or how we can really proceed where uh, go ahead where we run stuff. I think this main problem where we are now we have to find a common language between diaspora Armenians and Turkish civil society. This is what we are missing uh, and this was a point of conflict also and still as you know, in Turkey, there is a kind of, or has been an anti-diaspora attitude. 
even among those intellectual that you listed, uh, some of them still replace actually the old negative Armenian image with Armenian diaspora. So they developed an understanding, and still maybe they are working on it. There are good Armenians, this is our Armenians in Turkey, and those diaspora Armenians, they are, they are, those are bad Armenians. And there is a negative attitude towards diaspora, even among Turkish civil society. They don't like parliament resolutions. They don't want you push United States government, that they pressure Turkish government. So they don't like a lot of things what diaspora has been doing. And you might have heard in, uh, when he was alive, Durant was also talking towards that direction against parliament resolutions and so on. But he was also trying something else. One of his big ideas was, this is what we were debating and discussing, talking with each other, was he wanted to develop, he wanted to establish or organize a diaspora conference. His idea was, this is what I'm going to tell you, but we never heard this current saying this, but this was the issue that we were talking He was telling, we, civil society in Turkey and diaspora, we have to find a language. We have to find a common language. So this means the Turkish civil society should overcome this negative attitude towards diaspora, and diaspora also should change their looking their perception of Turkey a little bit. What is this? This is very simple. Diaspora was reluctant a little bit to acknowledge the development in Turkish civil society and they was not so aware on the point of freedom of speech in Turkey. And the people in Turkey mostly considered the entire Armenian genocide discussion as a problem of freedom of speech. And they were arguing what we need is freedom of speech, not the rest. But the diaspora, what the diaspora wants or wants today is justice. So you have the, a perfect choice. I know that in Hiram, think a word you call it uh, freedom of speech and justice actually. Both elements you incorporate it. So what the diaspora should really understand that the fight in Turkey for freedom of speech is actually is a fight for justice and what Turkish liberals should learn slowly what diaspora has been doing over the year their fight for justice is actually for the freedom of speech in Turkey they are not mutually exclusive and they should stop bickering with each other and attacking each other they should develop a language that emphasizes freedom of speech and the justice so because of that reason the one important way to change the things in Turkey that diaspora organizations should go to Turkey, get in touch with those old Turks who wants to know, know and learn, and you have to really invite more and more individuals here, and not only now Taner or Ahmed Hassan, the individuals that you know, maybe other organizations that you haven't met yet. So this should be, this nets should be developed and organized. I firmly believe if we develop diaspora, <coughs> Armenians and Turkish civil society, a common language, freedom of speech and justice and recognition of genocide, as one voice, we can change more, we can achieve more than what we have achieved. Okay, my time limit is running out, but I have two, two people and that's it. The gentleman on the right, and then you will finish with you. Okay. My name is Sarkis Manoukian. My question is, you made a statement about half an hour ago saying that in Turkey, every year as they commemorate the memory of Ramtin, there is a growing number of people coming and taking part in those commemorations. My specific question is about the academic circuits. Like we have a couple of professors like Halil Bergtai and some others that right now I don't remember. Because of your connections through your academic connections, what do you, do you think there is a specific movement within the academic circuits towards recognition of the genocide? 
how is it making? Is it making inroads, big inroads among academic circles? Uh, I give you a couple of examples. Um, I think the issue now is more than academics in Turkey. It was at the beginning really restricted, limited with Turkish academics. Now, uh, and you know, a couple of them they had they created a lot of problem for us by not using the term genocide. I am thankful to Turkish journalists. If it were Turkish academicians, we had been still debating whether or not we should use the term genocide. Or not. And you might have heard some lectures why genocide should not be used in case of Armenian genocide. Thanks to journalists, they started using the term genocide, now the problem is over in Turkey. So the, there is not a specific movement among academicians, but what's going on is outside the academia. This is the important part. In Berlin, when Hrantik was assassinated, it's only, it was only Berlin and Köln in two places, commemorations organized. And now today, in Berlin, not only one couple of commemorations, in Köln, and at least, I know that, because I'm in touch with this friend, at least in ten different states in Germany, there are commemorations. And in Turkey, it was only in Istanbul. Then it went to Izmir, and then it went to Ankara, to Diyarbakir. Now it's more than 20 places. The growing number is not only within academia, it is outside the academia. And for academia, we have to now see the half side of the glasses, the empty side. It is unfortunately, it was at the beginning also, Bilgi University, Savanji University, and uh, Boazic University. Mainly, most of the events in Istanbul have been organized by these three universities. There is not much addition yet. I, if, I'm, if you know, you can tell me, you can correct me. I don't remember any activity of any university in Ankara or in Izmir, Smyrna or any other big states. Just because they are organizing anti-Armenian genocide uh, events and so on. I think the change in academia would be the difficult one. This is my assessment of the world. And maybe one important addition to you, the recognition and the movement for justice will grow as the growth of Kurdish movement. I think there is a direct connection with the Kurdish question, the solving of Kurdish question and the recognition of Armenian genocide. This is more important than the other development within Turkish Academy. Wish we had a lot more time. Um, <coughs> sir? It was an honor having you here, and thank you for your hard work. My name is Wali Sarkisian. I'm the founder of Kakamu.net. I always ask this question. How old were you when, to, when you came to know Armenian genocide? When I was... Uh, I think 38, 39. Until that time, I had no idea. I didn't know that. I learned first in Germany when I was working on a different project. I think I wrote that I told you enough uh, until 1988 uh, when I started working in Hamburg in that institute. I even didn't know that there are Armenians living in Turkey. <laughs> My first Armenian friend was uh, Payel, he passed away, uh, cancer, uh, he, who introduced me to Grant, and they all came to me after the publication of my first book. This is how I learned the Armenians in Islam. I didn't know before that. Okay. <laughs> Professor Arjan, thank you very much. I think we all now know even better than what we knew uh, as to why he has accepted our humble award, uh, Meteora Treasure. I think we are all leaving, going home tonight with a lot more knowledge and thinking on this, the most important year. And hopefully, as you mentioned, United Armenians will get closer to the goal line. I also want to thank Professor Dekmejian for everybody joining us. We have a reception downstairs. Please welcome and have a great evening.